First, I'm going to turn it over to Claudio Martin. She is the what is it lecturer in residence um, at American University. So uh, she's going to do our introduction of our panel, and we'll get going tonight. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Wes. I, on behalf of the Academy on Human Rights and Humanitarian Law, um, I want to thank all of you for being here. We have been having this Human Rights Speaker Series with ACIL for three or four years now. It has been very successful. We uh, enjoy very much bringing our professors to the society to uh, give uh, the, the Washington community the opportunity to listen to the experts uh, on the different topics and panels that we organize every year. Um, this year we are going to have three panels. The first uh, uh, panel today uh, is about the role of the Inter-American Court as a pivotal uh, actor in upholding human rights in the Americas, jurisprudential construction and new challenges. And for uh, speaking about this very interesting topic, we have the experts. We have Judge uh, Eduardo Ferrer McGregor, who is currently serving as a judge of the Inter-American Court. Uh, uh, judge Antonio Cansado Trindade, who was uh, a judge of the Inter-American Court for a number of years, is now serving as a judge at the International Court of Justice. As a moderator, we have uh, Dean Monica Pinto from the Law School of uh, University of Buenos Aires. Monica is an expert in human rights and an expert on the Inter-American system. So uh, in addition to moderate, she will have the chance to make comments about the topics if she uh, feels that uh, there is something else to add. So thank you very much, everybody, for, for being here. Thank you very much to the American Society, to Mark Agrast and Wes Rist for hosting us here. Um, and I, I hope that you enjoy the panel. Thank you. OK. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, the American Society of International Law and American University Washington College of Law and the Academy on Human Rights and Humanitarian Law for this invitation. In fact, I'm, I'm deeply honored to be here with you today and to have the opportunity of sharing the panel with uh, two good friends, Antonio Cansado Trindade, with whom we have been walking the same way for more than 40 years, I think, and Eduardo Ferrer MacGregor, who, who we know each other from a number of years, not so long as with Antonio, but uh, a number of years. So it's not necessary to have such long relationships. <laughs> so uh, my pleasure to be moderating the panel. You know, today we will be dealing with the role of the inter of the Inter-American Court on Human Rights. The court, as you know, is an organ of the convention. It was established once the convention entered into force in 1978. And for the first years of its life, the court has been delivering advisory opinions. Once a good number of advisory opinions was there, uh, they started with the contentions uh, cases. Perhaps the first ruling of the Inter-American Court on Human Rights was a very good landmark on the history of the Inter-American System on Human Rights in the sense that that judgment, I'm referring of course to Velázquez Rodríguez, is a sort of manual of international humanitarian law and uh, because of the lack of positions and rules in the, in the, in the field, the court felt obliged to, to, to precise some uh, uh, criteria in law before and then to in, apply such a criteria to the given case. The point is that starting with Velazquez Rodriguez, the court has been playing an increasing role, not only in, in the expansion, in, in increasing the number of human rights protected by the system, but also in increasing the protection system itself. I think that Antonio Cansado is a sort of a, a very privileged actor of the system who has been there for a good time, almost 12 years, and he has acted as president of the court, and he, he has lots of things to share with us. In, in the period uh, Antonio was there, uh, a number of crucial uh, rights had been recognized by the, by the court. I'm referring, for instance, uh, um, to the right to the truth, to the right to live with dignity. Uh, the court also advanced some criteria as to the integration of the different rules of human rights, like in the street children case, Niños de la Calle, where the, the, the court refers to a unique corpus juris integrating universal uh, international law uh, human rights uh, rules with uh, regional rules, the same relating to, to women's rights, also dealing with indigenous rights. 
But Antonio also had the initiative when dealing with some procedural matters to go a step further uh, relating to the role of the victim, how the victim itself, uh, him or herself, could address the court with provisional measures and, and things like that. So his role in the, in the court was, uh, was uh, uh, very important. And he was there perhaps in the, in the, in the age of the, uh, the first years of the court had already been passed. So he was in the, in the youngest years of the court. And as a young uh, uh, body, the court during Antonio's uh, uh, time uh, uh, provided us with lots of examples of how to um, strengthen the, the protection of human rights. So Antonio, if you want, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Monica Pinto. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, the Academy of Humanitarian Law and Human Rights in the persons of Claudia Martin and Diego Rodriguez Pison to give me the opportunity to participate in this panel in the company of uh, moderator Professor Monica Pinto and of Judge Eduardo Ferrer Magredo. It's a great pleasure to share this panel with both of you, dear friends of many years, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to see friends from the American Society of International Law of many springs. <laughs> many springs. So uh, may I <coughs> start uh, by saying that uh, I feel very privileged to have participated, as Monica has just said, uh, in the work of the court at a time which was marked by a certain mystic. Uh, because we were just starting to build up our case law on the protected rights. Uh, if we look back in time, and it's good to do so from time to time, we see that uh, there were three uh, groups of cases in the first years of the court. A first group of cases was formed by those uh, cases concerning forced or uh, enforced disappearance of persons. And uh, this put us before uh, the notion of grave violations of human rights with consequences for reparations and uh, the notion of um, continuous breach, which uh, is a notion which is still being worked upon by international tribunals nowadays, not only the Inter-American Court, but international criminal tribunals and also the ICJ. Then the triple obligation to prevent, investigate the facts and sanction those responsible, which the Inter-American Court developed from its start, since it started its work while the European Court had to wait until the 90s to start elaborating its own conception of such obligations, especially positive obligations under the European Convention. It was much influenced by the case law of the Inter-American Court. And also the development of the notion of objective responsibility in the framework of the American Convention on Human Rights. So these were the features of this first group of cases that inaugurated the historical trajectory of the Inter-American Court. Now, the second group of cases from the late 90s onwards were cases that had to do with due process of law and access to justice. And uh, this group of cases gave the Inter-American Court, also in my years, I will speak uh, mainly for my years, uh, because then I wanted to listen to my successor in the court of the present day, uh, experience of the court. <laughs> but in my years, this gave the opportunity to uh, dwell upon and developed the interrelationship between Articles 8 and 25 of the American Convention of Access to Justice, 25, and the due process, uh, Article 8 of the Convention. Also, in relation with the general obligations of Articles 1st and 2nd of the American Convention. 
and uh, we developed our case law of uh, uh, criticism of tribunals of exception as well uh, in a series of cases that you are familiar with. Then, in the last decade, we had a new group of cases in the experience of the court, the cases of massacres. And uh, they inaugurated with the Barrios Altos. Then we had so many other cases, Plan de Sanchez, uh, concerning different uh, respondent states, and uh, Mapiripan, Ituango, Community Moiwana, and um, uh, 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 Lacantut, and so many others, uh, which brought into the fore uh, the, the case of what I used to call in those days aggravated international responsibility. A notion which some part of the doctrine did not want to elaborate on, but which survived in other international organs of super, supervision of um, uh, decisions of uh, supervisory organs of international instruments of human rights, also at the UN. And uh, this also had consequences for uh, reparations, the question of aggravated responsibility, and brought to the fore the survival of another basis of international responsibility, a responsibility on the basis of fault or culpa, culpa of Roman law. I thought that this belonged to the past, but facts always come before the norms. And uh, when these massacre cases came before the court, I realized that uh, there was still space for the responsibility based on culpa, on fault, when there was the intentionality of the commission of mass atrocities. And now I'm leaving this again in another jurisdiction, uh, in the ICJ. But I have uh, very clear memories of the experiences we had uh, with these massacre cases in the Inter-American Court. But we can c come back to this point later on, uh, at, at the time of our dialogue. If uh, I could uh, attempt to summarize the experience of the Inter-American Court during my years, I could detect um, uh, experience accumulated in the, in the domain of jurisdiction, in the domain of substantive law, in the domain of procedural law, and also in institutional domain. Let us start very briefly summarizing everything as much as I can, uh, questions of jurisdiction. During my years, we lived extremely hard moments. I think that if we had acted in a way different than what we did, probably the court would not have survived. Let me explain to you what I mean and give you the precise elements of this experience. Uh, the first was after the case Castillo Petrucci, you know, mm -hmm. and then there was the announcement on the part of the President of the Republic of the Respondent State that they would withdraw the acceptance of the compulsory jurisdiction of the court since it was a unilateral act that was presented, it would be withdrawn by another unilateral act. And we decided that this would be incompatible with the object and purpose of the convention because it was not foreseen in the convention itself, this uh, notion of withdrawal of unilateral act of acceptance of the court's jurisdiction. And then, just at that moment, I had been elected president of the court. And so I phoned the secretary general of the OAS and told him that I wanted immediately to meet him because this would affect the credibility of the court if we didn't react. And see, he told me that he was going to Canada, but he would wait me to arrive from Costa Rica here to Washington and we could talk. Then I took immediately a plane, uh, came to Washington, and he was waiting for me very kindly, and I, I told him 
uh, that I wanted him to notify all the states parties to the American Convention of what was happening, the threat of withdrawal, because this was the function of a depository of the uh, American Convention on Human Rights, and this needed the collective reaction of all states parties to the American Convention. And then uh, he accepted that, but after consultations with the ambassador uh, of the respondent state, he also inserted another paragraph in the notification to all the, the delegations of OAS member states, uh, appreciating the work against terrorism that was done, in the, but had nothing to do with the, with the problem that was be, before. And so this created a certain confusion. But anyway, he understood that he had to do this. He had to notify the member states. He was an engineer, so he did not know very much about international law. <laughs> but uh, he did it well in notifying, but only with this additional paragraph that confused uh, many persons, because it was not the, po the, the point at issue. Uh, after that, there was not much re reaction. This was in 1999. The General Assembly was in the city of Guatemala, but in the following General Assembly, there was some reaction to it. It was in the city of Windsor in Canada, a country which was very much open to the NGOs, and, and there was lots of NGOs. And then, uh, of course, when I spoke to the Secretary General, I asked, of course, the support of my six colleagues at the Inter-American Court, and they gave me a letter of support. And they did the same in the General Assembly of Windsor in Canada. I brought a letter of all judges asking for the application of um, Article 65, the sanction, the only sanction provided for in the American Convention. And then there was a, a great discussion. All the delegations uh, took the floor. Mm -hmm. And at the end, a commission was formed by the Premier of Canada together with the Secretary General, and they went to Lima, and they collected a 27-point document, including the compromis to go back uh, to continue to accept the jurisdiction of the court, uh, as if nothing had happened. And in the, as to the hearings in which they had not appeared, I always read uh, a provision of the rules of the court saying that if a country does not uh, appear, uh, the, the, the court can continue uh, knowing the case, uh, and uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the country can come back later and continue participating, but uh, without prejudice to the tramitation, to the proceedings of the case. No? I think it was very important to have acted that way, otherwise the court would not have survived this, this crisis. No? The second one, uh, the respondent state went by the book because it denounced the convention, denunciation was was uh, foreseen in, in the uh, convention itself. And the state denounced and uh, said that it, there would be no contempt of the court if after the decision on uh, preliminary objections, which uh, discarded the preliminary objection of Trinidad and Tobago in the cases concerning Hilaire, Benjamin, and Constantine, uh, then they, they would not appear because they thought that the interpretative declaration that was appended to its uh, recognition of the court's uh, jurisdiction uh, was very important for them. Uh, according to this interpretative declaration, um, the Trinidad and Tobago would accept the compulsory jurisdiction of the court, but not in relation to cases in which there would be a conflict with the provision of the national constitution, which would mean that the constitution would be placed above a treaty. And uh, it's interesting that uh, the Privy Council in London uh, put pressure upon the country to consider as a remedy also international remedies. So uh, uh, from then onwards, they did not appear. But at the end, after the decision on the merits was rendered, they complied with it. So these were the two crises in which we applied uh, Article 65 of the Convention. This was a very important question on of uh, jurisdiction, another one was in the cases of, uh, it's a case which I have in my memory, you know, it's very clear until today, the Constitutional Tribunal. It was such an important case because three members of the Constitutional Tribunal who had been removed from office because they voted against uh, the uh, re-eligibility of the President of the Republic, Fujimori, at that time. And uh, um, then, uh, again, uh, 
we were placed before a deep constitutional crisis there uh, when three members of the constitutional court had been dismissed from office because they just uh, voted in the way that their conscience said they should vote. And this case is fascinating because we, we have seen in these cases that international jurisdiction came to help national jurisdiction. It's, it's, I think this case was avant-garde. It's a, it's a case, it's, it's, a, it's an example for other tribunals as well. Uh, and um, when we ordered in the judgment on the merits that they, these judges should be restituted to the position, that they should retake their offices, and all that, so they were. There had been internal changes in the country, and they, they were, again, uh, members of the Constitutional Court, and one of the three who had been dismissed became the president of the Constitutional Court. And uh, it's, uh, in the first session that they had, they invited me to attend the session. I went there. They were very moved. Two of them, uh, they died a few months later, natural causes. And, but one, uh, one of the judges uh, remains alive and asked for provisional measures later on, uh, a, lady, a lady judge. And, uh, yeah. Very impressive case, very impressive case. And uh, I think uh, it shows that uh, some, the importance of international jurisdiction. International jurisdiction rescued national jurisdiction. You see, when there is a crisis with domestic courts, then an international court came to help the national court. It's uh, an example which does not have a parallel in other continents. It's amazing, this case, and it's, I'll never forget it. Um, there's another example. Uh, the other, in, it's still concerning jurisdiction, the other element which is in my memory is very alive, the cases of recognition of responsibility. The first, the early cases, I, uh, they were taken uh, um, at littering, uh, that uh, the court should accept uh, uh, the recognition of responsibility, but the court did not have yet much experience on that. And uh, so it just took the recognition of responsibility in the way that was presented before the court. The first case ever was Alubutu, Alubutu against Suriname. And uh, I remember uh, where this was negotiated in one, in one hotel in San Jose, no, it was, uh, there was bona fides on the part of the state and it complied with all the, uh, it was a fascinating case. Uh, uh, the seven persons who had been killed, members of a community, they left 17 widows because polygamy was uh, no legal in, uh, so we sent the deputy registrar to Paramaribo. No? Mm -hmm. You remember her? Yeah. And uh, she made uh, an in loco visit uh, studying the constitutional law of the country and the uh, customary law. And then we found that all of them were beneficiaries of reparations because polygamy was uh, recognized in uh, domestic law. So we took uh, the customary law also into account. You see, and uh, in the inter-American system, I mean, there is a, a reference in the preamble of the convention and the American Declaration of the Rights and Human Rights in relation to general international law, to customary law as well. This is fascinating. It's another very important case you know, in relation to uh, the beneficiaries of reparations. And, uh, oh, the time is already, and I'm still in the first lot, so let me move to, <laughs> let me move to the, Let's to the substantive, the <laughs> substantive law issues, and then uh, because we could spend the whole day here, yeah, uh, no. uh, it's, I'm, I'm so happy <laughs> to be navigating again in the troubled waters of our region. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead with substantive. So substantive law, uh, I have already referred to uh, basis of uh, state responsibility. That uh, there is a coexistence of base of responsibility. It's not only objective responsibility, but it's also. Um, a responsibility uh, for intentional breaches of international law, responsibility on fault, the both bases of responsibility come from Roman law. Then crimes of state, I have always defended the existence of crimes of state. Uh, I know that in doctrine, especially my colleagues from the International Law Commission, they don't like that. 
uh, because they had to erase crimes of state from their drafts in order for the draft to be approved by the General Assembly of the UN, but crimes of state do exist. I can come back to this point later on in our dialogue. Then we had, uh, during my years, an extraordinary conceptual expansion of the material content of Jus Cogens. Uh, I am very happy that we managed to do that during my years. We started with the prohibition of torture. Cantoral Benavides, uh, Gomes Pacquiauri, the brothers Gomes Pacquiauri, torture is an absolute prohibition. It's prohibited in all circumstances. Then we widened it a little bit. In the case of TB against Ecuador and of Caesar against Trinidad Tobago. Say so not only torture, but also cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment. Then later on, the rapporteur on torture, uh, my friend Nigel Rodley, so Nigel Rodley, a friend of mine uh, from Nottingham, and, and he told me that this was very good because he himself had reconceptualized it so as to encompass not only torture itself in the classic uh, conception, but also cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment. Then we came with advisory opinion number 16 and 18, uh, mainly the 18th. Because then we said that a breach of the basic principle of equality and non-discrimination, also it is a breach of just cause. And this was extremely important. It's groundbreaking. I think this advisory opinion is groundbreaking, like the 16th as well. And I'm very happy that now the court has issued the 21st advisory opinion in your times, uh, Judge Fer uh, McGregor, because now uh, there are three opinions moving in the same direction. And... Uh, I realize nowadays, when I look back, that the principle of equality and non-discrimination, which is so much invoked, has very insufficiently been dwelt upon in expert writing. Very insufficiently. It, it requires much more attention than what has been given to it until now. And finally, the most uh, luminous moment of this expansion of the material content of Jus Cogens, we said that it encompassed as well access to justice. Goiburu al monasi de la cantuta. And this, my God, I've seen so many eyebrows raised in Europe, my colleagues in Europe, they, oh, how can you have done that? Access to justice, a breach of just cause. And they, they invited me to give the opening election in the Strasbourg Institute in 2007. And I said, yes, because you, have always interpreted Article 6 of the European Convention as from the restrictions, taking into account the restrictions and limitations of access to justice. Your interpretation is restrictive. Ours is not. Article 25, a breach of access to justice. If there is no access to justice, then there is no legal system at all. And they really, and now they are rethinking about it. They are very much worried. But there was a lot of discussion. There was more, more discussion about this in Europe than here. Incredible, because it, it touched on their conscience, my, my colleagues from Europe. But anyway, uh, right to life, we, we approached it from a much broader perspective, you know, a project of life, and I also spoke of a project of afterlife, but, uh, you know, <laughs> because we have to prepare ourselves for our afterlife. You know? <laughs> anyway, uh, and now, Procedural, procedural law, with that I finish these introductory remarks. The procedural law, the inherent faculties of the, of, of, of the court as an international tribunal, we always defended that. We are not limited by the arguments of the parties. We can always uh, bring into the fore another element, even if it was not, not mentioned by the parties, uh, Jura Novit Curia. No, and this is very important that the court do that. In many occasions, we have done that. Uh, during my years, I made a point of, in the hearings, counting on uh, experts coming from different areas of human knowledge, because uh, I do not believe that law is self-sufficient. I'm not a positivist, thank God. And uh, so we can benefit from other areas of human knowledge. And then uh, we um, tried to integrate the different provisions of the convention into the whole of the convention, not interpret them isolatedly, but taking the object and purpose of the convention, a teleological approach uh, in the interpretation of provisions of the convention. And um, then, Two other elements, with that I finish this introduction, two other elements of great importance, uh, the case law on two aspects. 
provisional measures, it was extremely important, the case law provisional measures, and on reparations. Uh, I think it was an example for other tribunals on the question of reparations. Provisional measures, I always uh, uh, pointed out that there are two dimensions, not only the horizontal dimension, which is what everyone quotes, they are, uh, they are binding uh, erga omnes, uh, all the members of the international community, but that's what the ICJ said in Barcelona Traction. But uh, it, it does not exhaust the matter. There is also a vertical dimension in which sense that uh, these provisional measures are binding not only in the relations between the public power of the state and the individuals concerned, but also in the relations of individuals inter se, for example, detained persons, persons that are in prisons and all that, the relations between individuals. Why uh, and how? Why and how can the relations between individuals be of concern to the court? Yes, because of positive obligations of states. Not that uh, the states are responsible for uh, having committed, no, but uh, for, for the op uh, omissions, for instance, uh, people that are detained and then they kill each other and all that, there are no conditions the, uh, for people in detention. This is an example, but there are other examples as well. So, Brit Wirkung, as the German doctrine says, and, but the relations between individuals is also of concern of the court if the state allows a pattern of, of uh, violations to occur. So this is very interesting. I think that this issue is still uh, requiring much thinking. It has not been exhausted in, in legal doctrine. And finally, reparations. Well, this is, I think this is uh, an area in which the court has been doing a lot. The court has done much, uh, especially in the forms of, the, of reparations, uh, more than any other tribunal, I would say, much more than the European court much more than other tribunals. And recently, uh, three times I went to the ICC at The Hague. They asked me to explain to them the cases of collective reparation, especially in the case of massacres. And that's why uh, they referred to our case law in the case of Lubanga. The mm. Lubanga case, they quote very much the Inter-American Court on the question of reparations, because this is the experience that we have with uh, collect human collectivities and different forms of reparations, not only pecuniary, but also other forms of reparations. But I better uh, restrain and control myself and uh, come to an end. And I thank you for your attention. And uh, I'll give you the Thank you very much, Antonio. I, I, I think I could have added lots of other things that the court has been doing during your time uh, there. For instance, the, the, the renewal of the rules of the court dealing with the participation of the individual, provisional measures not dealing only with the right to life and many other things. But perhaps you can keep that for the, for the dialogue. Now Eduardo Ferrer has proposed us to, to talk about the conventionality control. And this conventionality control of the Inter-American uh, Court on Human Rights means a sort of decentralization of the monitoring procedure. It is centralization that the court uh, um, asks all the, uh, at the very beginning from Almonacid in seven years, the court has done that uh, 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 quite fast. Um, at the very beginning, a sort of monitoring by judicial authorities then by all state authorities not only on the rules on the application of the American uh, uh, rules on dealing with the American Convention on Human Rights and other rules of the American system on human rights but also with other uh, domestic provisions too so the point is whether this um, conventionality control uh, is uh, perceived and is envisaged by the court itself as something that is changing the profile of the court, whether we are moving from a court on human rights, as, as the one we are having, to a different court, a court that will be dealing with human rights, but perhaps, and I'm lacking uh, uh, words because I'm only an internationalist, but perhaps like a constitutional court or something like that. So. We are very much expecting what you have to tell us, Eduardo, about this conventionality control. Please. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, well, thank you uh, so much to the Academy on Human Rights. Um, thank you, Claudia. Thank you, uh, Diego, uh, for the invitation to teach at the American University and uh, to invite me uh, to be here in this uh, panel. Thank you to the American Society of International Law. 
I apologize for my bad English, so I will please ask uh, Monica Pinto if she can help me sometime. <laughs> uh, <Okay>. Yes, <laughs> I will need help. <laughs> and of course, uh, thank you all of you to be here. And um, as Monica said, I will talk about this uh, new role of the court, the mm -hmm. uh, new doctrine of the court, the uh, conventionality control, but we will see that it's not new. Okay. It's not new. <laughs> That's an important it's thing. It's the new name of an, an old institution. Yes. <laughs> That's good. That's good. And we have the creator here. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a, really an honor to be with uh, my friend uh, uh, Antonio Augusto Cansado Trindade, as you know, former uh, president of the Inter American Court, and I think one of the most um, important judges in all history of the courts. No, I think we, uh, 34 judges in all his, in these 36 years. And uh, when we talk about, when we read, but when we li listen, Antonio Cansado, we uh, always learn something. No, I learn a lot today. And of course, my friend uh, Monica Pinto. Uh, you're very famous in Mexico. You know? <laughs> yes. Um, as you all know, I see some Mexicans here. Uh, here, um, Because of the conventionality control, part a uh, Radilla case, they changed the uh, constitution, and, they, and in other things, they uh, constitutionalize the principle of a pro Homin. persona. Yes. <laughs> And Monica wrote 15 years Very ago, something, something like that, Record. one of the most important and relevant articles in this uh, matter. And right now, everyone is uh, reading Monica Pint. <laughs> I will have to write another one. <laughs> <laughs> it has more than 20 please, years, please. I please. think. <laughs> well, um, one of the most recent and effective efforts of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights to increase the level, level of compliance with the American Convention at the domestic level is uh, the creation of this doctrine, the conventionality control. The court has understood that conventionality control as an institution that is used to enforce international law, primarily international human rights law, and specifically the American Convention and other sources, including, this is very important, including the court's jurisprudence. The doctrine creates an international obligation. That's right, I, I'm gonna repeat it. The doctrine creates an international obligation incumbent on all state authorities uh, of the American Convention to interpret any domestic legal norm, constitutional, law, decree, regulation, judicial decisions, etc., in accordance with the Pact of San Jose and in general with the Corpus Juris Interamericano. If there is a clear incompatibility between domestic law and the Corpus Juris Interamericano, state authorities must refrain from applying the domestic norm in order to prevent the violation of internationally protected human rights. State authorities must exercise the conventionality control ex officio, ex officio, but always acting within their respect, respective compet competence and the corresponding procedural regulations, which are entirely defined by domestic law. Um, uh, after this brief introduction, I would like to divide my presentation in three parts. First, I think it's very important to, uh, to see the origins and the uh, jurisprudential developments of the doctrine of conventionality control until now. Um, second, the main elements of this doctrine. And third, the conduct requires by national uh, authorities, uh, by the conventionality control, and final, some uh, final remarks. So uh, let's go, let's move to um, the origins and jurisprudential developments. Um, everyone says that uh, this doctrine was, uh, it was the leading case is Almonacid Arellano 2006. 
Well, that's not true. Okay. Uh, that's the first time the court uh, write it like that, no? But before, I think there are very important cases. Uh, Suarez Rosero versus Ecuador, 1997, when uh, the president of the court was uh, Cansado Trindade. And this is very important but because it was the first time, 1997, that the court uh, uh, examine, uh, evaluate the compatibility of a domestic law with a convention. That's very important. This case, I think, is uh, uh, very important. For example, it says uh, in, the, in this judgment, 1997, this, uh, this law, it was an, uh, from Ecuador, violates per se Article 2 of the convention. Whether or not it was enforced in the instant case, per se, that's 1997. And of course, in Barrios Altos, no? In Barrios Altos in 2001, the leading case about the amnesty laws, um, uh, start the practice to declare nullity and an uh, amnesty law ad initio. That was in 2001, five years before I want to see that again. So these cases, I think they're very important um, to think how the uh, Inter-American Court creates the doctrine, because it was already created. No? Um, and of course, well, the last intention of Christ, no? that against Chile, that was the first time that uh, 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 consider null a constitution norm. No? So these are like uh, precedents before Almonacida Arellano that we have to see very clear to understand the uh, doctrine of the conventionality control. And of course, we have to see some con concurrent votes, very important, uh, Sergio Garcia Ramirez, former president of the Inter-American Court, Sergio Garcia Ramirez, in Mirna Macheng, Guatemala, 2003, or in, in case of TV versus Ecuador, or in Vargas uh, Areco versus Paraguay, and of course, the, con uh, the con uh, concurrent opinion of Augusto Cansado Trindade in some uh, cases in 2006. So, um, but however, it's true, it's until 2006, almost nine years, uh, yes, almost. Seven. Um, six, seven, eight, nine, Almost. Almost nine, yeah. We're lawyers, no? <laughs> <laughs> nine, nine. How, uh, yes, until two, uh, 2006, that the doctrine of conventionality controls de developed uh, in the case of Almonacid versus Chile, as an obligation incumbent on domestic judges. The present set in, in Almonacid was repeat with some modifications two months later in the case of dismissed congressional employees, mm -hmm. Aguado Alfaro versus Peru. Mm -hmm. And I think the precisions that the court made, they're very important to the future of, the, uh, of this doctrine. No? In Aguado Alfaro, uh, the court said uh, established the doctrine of conventionality control uh, is advanced in two respects. First, it should be exercised ex officio, mm -hmm. without the parties being obligated to invoke it. And second, it must be exercised by domestic, uh, do domestic judges within the framework of their respective competences and the corresponding procedural regulations, which are defined by domestic law. It doesn't mean, a, I don't know how to say it, un control de convencionalidad salvaje, without control. <laughs> we, no, no. no. Uh, a wild uh, <laughs> <laughs> conventionality control. No, no, it has to be, it has to be, this is very important, in the framework of their respective competence, national competence, and the corresponding procedural regulations which are defined by domestic law. I think it's not in the international law, it's in the domestic law. So there, thereafter, since these uh, two cases, I'm talking about Almonacida Arellano and Alguado Alfaro, both in 2006, until now, thereafter, in, in 25 contentious cases, the Inter-American Court has ruled in various aspects of the conventionality control, 
in cases involving the international responsibility of 14 different states, 14 different states, Argentina, Barbados, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Guatemala, Mexico, Panama, Paraguay, Peru, Dominican Republic, Uruguay, and Venezuela. That is, more than half of the states which have recognized the compulsory jurisdiction of the courts. 25, 20, uh, more than 25 cases, 14 uh, different states. Um, but but um, I think the following cases are particularly important in the development of the doctrine of conventionality control after uh, Aguado Alfaro case. First, Eleodoro Portugal versus Panama, 2008. Second, Radiga, Radiga Pacheco versus Mexico, 2009. Third, Cabrera Garcia and Montiel Flores versus Mexico, 2010. The Hellman the famous Uruguay. Hellman case uh, versus Uruguay, 2011. The supervision of enforcement of Hellman case, 2013. And the advisory opinion, the new advisory opinion 21 uh, on the rights and guarantees of children in the context of migration, 2014. I think in these, four, uh, these uh, cases, uh, the, the court uh, advanced in some aspect of the doctrine. In Eleodoro, Portugal, 2008, the court determined that the failure of the state to define the crime of forced disappearance as an autonomous offense uh, hindered uh, uh, the effective development of the criminal proceedings against those responsible for the forced disappearance of Mr. Eleodoro, Portugal, condition that allowed the perpetuation of impunity for serious human rights violation. The court recalled the perpetuation of impunity for serious human rights violation. Um, the, the court recalled that the obligation to define forced disappearance as an autonomous crime is an obligation arising from Article 2 of the American Convention, but also Article 3 of the Inter-American Convention on Forced Disappearance of Persons. Under both provisions, the court also found that the conventionality control was helpful, helpful to comply with the international obligations of the state and ensure the effective, effectiveness, not only of the American Convention, but also the Inter-American Convention of Forced Disappearance of Persons. In the Radilla Pacheco case, 2008, was crucial for the development of the doctrine of the conventional control, because the court established that the conventional control consists in the duty of judges to interpret in a manner consist, consistent with the convention, and not just in a, in a, in ceasing to enforce rules which are manifestly contrary to the convention. This approach means a logical advancement in the understanding of the doctrine of the conventionally control. In the practice of domestic courts, a violation does not allow the rise from a clear incompatibility between domestic legislation and the convention. On the contrary, it is often um, the interpretation of a domestic norm by judges would lead to the international responsibility of the state. For this reason, the court interpreted that the doctrine of the conventionality control require, requires primarily that state authorities conduct a consistent interpretation, a consistent interpretation between the rules of the national legal system and the convention and the jurisprudence of the court, regardless uh, of whether the law is per se incompatible with the convention. Later, in the Cabrera Garcia case, 2010, extend the range of authorities that are under an obligation to exercise the conventionality control. Since this judgment, all state organs, including judges, should exercise a conventionality control. Similarly, in the uh, Hellman case, 2011, the Inter-American Court left no doubt in the sense that all state authorities, not only judges, all state authorities must exercise conventionality control, of course, I repeat, within their respective framework of competence. Because, I start quote, when, I state, when a state is a party to an international treaty, such as the American Convention, all its organs including the judges are subject to it, uh, which 
requires them to ensure that the effects of the provisions of the Convention are not affected by the informants of norms contrary to the ob object and purpose. So all state authorities must exercise a con conventionality control ex officio. Some issues which had been a source of debate uh, when uh, designing the doctrine of the conventionality control, namely the normative force of the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court and the subsequent duty of the uh, authorities to exercise a control of domestic norms based on the interpretation of the court were settled in the resolution of compliance with the Hellman case in 2013. This is a very important, uh, 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 well, yes, uh, very, well, ad an advance, I think, I think, I don't know. Uh, in this sense, the court clarified that there are two different manifestations of the obligation to enforce the court's jurisprudence, depending on whether the state is a party or not to the case where the, stands, the standards has been established. In the first case, the judgments of the court must be fully complied with, uh, with because the states are obligated under Article 68 to comply with the decision of the court in any case to which they are parties. In cases where the state is not a party to the controversy, the court determined that for the mere fact of being party to the convention, state authorities should take the convention and the jurisprudence of the court as a parameter to guide the creation and enforcement of domestic law. And finally, very recent, uh, just some months ago, in the advisory opinion 21, it was, I think, in October, uh, October 2014, on the rights, in the advisory opinion on the rights and of guarantees of children in the context of migration and or in need of international protection, that state authorities must also take advisory opinions into account when carrying out the conventionality control. The court uh, reasoned that since the purpose of the court's judgment the result from the exercise of its contentious jurisdiction is the same as the one pursued with the creation of advisory opinion, that is, the protection of human rights, states must follow all the interpretation emanating from both sources, contentious cases and advisory opinions. The court considered that advisory opinions are a source of law that contribute to secure the effective respect and guarantee of human rights and in particular, and especially preventively, preventively, to achieve an effective way to respect and guarantee human rights and, in particular, constitute a guide to be used to resolve issues about children in the context of migration and prevent any violation of human rights. So, um, the Inter-American Court has uh, sustained the view that states must follow the Inter-American Court jurisprudence by taking into consideration how courts of the highest rank in several states of the region refer to the building nature of, ju of the ju judgments of the Inter-American Court and the way by which these domestic courts have received or applied the conventionality control taking into account the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court, even before Almonacid Arellano uh, case. So in this sense, the court has uh, cited cases from Argentina, Bolivia, Colombia, uh, Colombia, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Mexico, Panama, Peru, and Dominican Republic that already use the uh, conventionality control. Some of these states before Almonacid Arellano in 2010. But not only in contentious cases, but also we can see, uh, for example, in one important case, in Aguado Alfaro case, Josh Antonio Cansado, in an uh, important uh, uh, concrete opinion, uh, consider, um, well, I will repeat it, I will read it just as uh, Antonio Cansado wrote it. Uh, he could not accept that the court abstained from exercise its duty to control the conventionality in this proceeding for interpretation of judgment and that it is satisfied to leave to a later stage of supervision of execution of judgment examining eventual difficulties that might exist. 
And afterwards, just for example, between 2008 and 2012, the Inter-American Court adopts seven supervision of compliance decision in which it alluded to the conventionality control. And in the past two years, 2013 and 2014, uh, more than eight supervision of compliance decisions has been issued by the Inter-American Court uh, using this doctrine. Um, just what was, uh, some minutes to... Uh, cinco, cinco. Cinco, five more minutes. Well, <laughs> the main elements of the doctrine. What are the main elements of the doctrine? Uh, I think the... the we can, well, we can talk about a lot of elements, but there are three that I think very important. The authority is obligated to carry out the, this uh, doctrine. Uh, the in intensity which, uh, uh, with which the authorities need to exercise the conventionality control. And third, the parameter through which this control takes place. The first element, it is possible to say it, that it is an extensive control that reaches all state authorities, whether belonging to, a, a, to the executive, legislative, or judiciary powers, since the obligation to respect and ensure rights under Articles 1.1 and 2 of the American Con Convention correspond to the state as a whole, and therefore cannot be subject to the division of powers stipulated by domestic law. The second element was established by the Inter-American Court, I think, well established in Alfaro case, I just uh, said before, uh, that uh, state authorities, judges in that case, in that particular case, should exercise the conventionality control ex officio, but evidentially under their respective jurisdiction and the corresponding procedural regulation. And uh, well, the, the third, um, aspect or the third element is uh, uh, is the parameter of the uh, control uh, the rules that serve as the basis of the exercise of the conventionality control are those contained in the corpus juris interamerican of course not only the american convention but all the corpus juris interamericano and likewise, by virtue of the recent decision of the advisory opinion, it is understood that the interpretation of the convention that have been established in advisory opinions must also be taken into account by domestic authorities when exercising the conventionality um, control. And w the last thing that I want to uh, share is that the, the conduct requires by the conventionality control, what uh, has uh, to be done by the uh, national authorities. Well, the first is to interpret domestic laws in accordance with the rules and principles of the corpus juris interamericano, and not enforcing domestic norms in cases where no interpretation in accordance with the convention is possible. This last scenario, when the domestic authority has the power to disregard a norm, when an authority finds a rule to be uh, manifestly incompatible with the convention and has the power to declare its invalidity with general effects, which is the power granted to certain constitutional courts in Latin America countries, um, the authority must declare the invalidity in order to avoid future violations to international law. Likewise, the conventionality control also has an important role to play in the compliance with the decision of the Inter-American Court, especially when such compliance is incum incumbent on domestic judges. This standard was created, as I already said, in the uh, monitoring compliance with the judgment of Helmand in 2013. Not only res uh, judicata, but also res interpretata. <laughs> uh, it was an important current. <laughs> I think it was in 2007 that uh, Judge Cansado Trindade used the, uh, the interpretata. interpretata, res interpretata, uh, for expansive of the jurisprudence uh, of uh, the court. Well, as a conclusion, at the heart of the conventionality control is the idea of dialogue. 
especially of judicial dialogue on human rights questions between domestic courts and the inter-American courts. On the one hand, the doctrine of conventionality control is a manifestation of this judicial dialogue. Since the creation and design of the doctrine in the Almonacid Arellano case responds to the phenomenon of constitu constitutionalization of international law, which the court noticed in several constitution provisions and in the decision of the highest court of several states in the region. On the other hand, the conventionality control is a tool that enables domestic authorities to use the standards of the Corpus Juris Interamericano for the resolution of cases involving human rights violation. However, the conventionality control is not a tool that seeks to impose a homogeneous view on human rights in the inter-American system. I think that the proper zona principle and the, the logic of normative pluralism are at the genesis of the conventionality control as states remain free to adopt more protective standards than those provided by the corpus juris interamericano. The interamerican court is aware that the international human rights is the minimum protection of human rights, not the maximum protection that states can and most guarantees to persons subject of their jurisdiction. In fact, the Inter-American Court takes the standard established by domestic court into account when it, when it performs conventionality control at the international level. Thus, the con conventionality control contributes to the generation of a just constitutionale comune in Latin America, which is the result of a construction that depends on normative minimum standards on human rights and derived from the jurisprudential dialogue between the Inter-American Court and the state's parties to, to the American Convention. Always, always keeping in mind that um, the constitutions of the states of the Inter-American system share a set of values and principles that focus on dignity and rights. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Eduardo. I think that we learned a lot from the constitutionalization of international law. Let's uh, try to, to uh, speculate a little bit of the internationalization of constitutional law and see what happens after that. No, in any case, and I, I'm opening the floor, um, Perhaps something we should be thinking, and, and perhaps that gives you the opportunity to close this panel in 20 minutes uh, with a word on that, is how um, we learned a lot on how the in Inter-American Court on Human Rights enlarged the protected rights, their scope, and enlarged the protective uh, tools. How we are going, uh, through what means we are protecting people in, in the Americas. Uh, the point is, and, and how this uh, protection has been decentralized because of this conventionality control. The point is, um, all these achievements have to be measured against a reality in which uh, some states are leaving the system and others are warning us that they want to leave the system. So how to balance this increased protection of rights, more rights, larger scopes, more tools, uh, and to how to cope the, 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 the situation with these states that having been in the system when they say, okay, I'm living, and I'm living in a year. And I'm living because I do uh, feel some dissatisfaction with the system. Some of us may have own opinions on how this satisfaction is because of very personal and peculiar ways uh, and, and, and approaches to democracy, to the way of running affairs in states and so forth. But, um, Okay, the fact is they are living. And, and, and our purpose, of course, and the purpose of the, the court itself, uh, uh, 
all of you have been saying that while in office as judges, we want a universal system, uh, stop with the three standard system, we want all the American states to be in the system, to ratify the convention, to accept the jurisdiction of the court, and the court to be able to say the law to everybody in the Americas. So, the floor is yours. Who's starting? Here you have a hand. The, the, you start, simply. Okay. I'll make perhaps one provocative one. Um, well, perhaps we can make an analogy that the proper persona principle is something quite similar to what Kelsen has tried to explain as the grand norm. I would say that pro persona is the grand principle that use it to interpret the law in general. I know that Kelsey is not the very author of Professor Consultor and that has fought a lot with the positivists, but it gives me at least an argument to explain a specific example in which eventually the Inter-American Court can be more restrictive than the Inter-American Commission and also than the domestic judges. I can give an ex a specific example. The use of criminal law for sanctioning public opinions. In the case of Kimmel, for instance, for the first time the court expressly said that it's not against Article 13 of the American Convention. However, it is against principle number 10 of the intra-American principle on freedom of expression since 2001, it is established. How should a judge guide the application of the international human rights law when the standard of the intra-American court is more restrictive than the intra-American commission or eventually the constitutional court? We have a couple of questions and you answer afterwards, or you want to answer yeah, one by better, one? Better. One by one. Okay, Antonio. <laughs> He's the boss. No, 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 that's... He's the boss. No, no it's Hello? because uh, the question, uh, I would like to thank uh, Daniel Serquira for the question. It's so provocative <laughs> that uh, I, would not, I would not like to wait long to, to try to respond to it very kindly. No, uh, thank you very much. I think that the the solution is in the American Convention itself, because unlike other uh, international uh, conventions on human rights, the American Convention expressly provides that in case of such a conflict, it's the norm which best protects that applies, no? Article 29. So uh, if, if the domestic norm uh, offers better protection, then the domestic norm would apply, mm -hmm. you see? And this uh, brings us to the point made by Judge Eduardo Ferrer, no? Uh, we should seek the interaction between the two normative orders. Uh, and this is precisely why I feel a bit sorry about Hans Kelsen. <laughs> you know, because uh, when he advanced the, the notion of Grundnorm, uh, he had the idea that we could think of a gr Grundnorm only at domestic law level, but not at international level. Because in the international level, there was a horizontalization of norms. There was not a verticalization. And then there was a fantastic debate between him in the thir late 30s and early 40s and, uh, and uh, uh, James Brierley, the two of them, uh, on whether we could extend the same reasoning to international law. Uh, Brierley said, yes, we can. And Kelsen said, no. We cannot because there is no verticalization at international law level. But then when Kelsen moved to the, to the United States after the war, he started studying more political science. And then he started reconsidering what he had written about Grund Norm in the domain of uh, domestic law. And then later on, at the late years of his life, he moved from political science to theology. So uh, this is the line that we can pursue in life. We start with domestic law, then to move to international law, and then end up studying theology. But the problem is that the, I, I criticize very much both of them, because Brierley did not have enough courage to, to advance his ideas and say, well, there are certain elements that are above the norm, the principles. That's what I said in my general course at the Hague Academy in 2005. He should have said, Principles. Principles are above any norm. Kelsen didn't say that because he, has, he had his own conceptual construction. And Brian because he didn't dare. But if you don't have the prima principia, you don't have 
a legal system. They are above the law. So what explains the legal system, either at domestic or at international law, is meta juridical. Is meta juridical. Uh, law itself uh, is limited. Uh, so this is what I would like to, to respond, and thank you very much for this provocation. Thank you. <laughs> we go on with the questions. Yes, I think that they're in the second line that they had raised their hand before Christina. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Katia Salazar, and I am the executive director of the Due Process of Law Foundation, an NGO based here and working in, in Latin America. I, want, I would like, at least, uh, to make also a provocative question uh, to any of us, uh, and it is related to the uh, question that Professor Monica Pinto made, and also to the interesting review of the main highlights uh, and potential crisis that court went through during the last years. Um, and it is related a proposal, a, a concrete proposal that uh, the president of Ecuador has been making during the last months in relation to the inter-American human rights system. He has said publicly, repeatedly, clearly that he thinks that, I mean, he, we need a reform of the inter-American system uh, we don't need the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, and we need a Latin American system of human rights uh, integrated or, or made up just by the country, just by, by the states that have uh, signed the Inter-American Convention of Human Rights. Um, this is public. He has made these statements last week in their speech to the nation, in the Summit of the Americas in Panama, and also in the meeting of CELAC in January. It's in the media. You can fi find them. Um, so. Mm, how do you connect this information with uh, Professor Pinto's question and also with the possibility to have a new judge in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, rights from Ecuador, no? So what, is the, what would be the connection with this uh, idea? Thank you. Who wants to start? Provocation is that? Provocation, yeah. Well, first of all, I agree with Judge uh, Cansado Trindade. I think the solution it's in Article 29 of the American Convention. And this Article uh, 29, not because, it, or because it's in the, this principle, pro persona, but also because it's, it's part of the constitutions right now of uh, many of the uh, Latin America countries. No? Um, I was trying to see here the, the form of uh, Article 1 of uh, Paragraph 2 of uh, Mexican Constitution. And uh, it's not only a principle, it's a norm no? that the old uh, authority has to uh, apply. So this Article 29 principle, well, it's an international law that is part of the law of the, of the countries, but also it has been constitutionalized in some of these countries. No? So, well, I agree. <laughs> and the other thing, the other question, Let's see, only 20 countries, well, 25 have, a, we all know, no? there's three levels, or maybe four, no? I don't know, four levels of intensity of this inter-American system. That's a reality. No? Um, I don't know if they're connected with the candidate or not. That's, but we will see, the fifth, uh, we have to be very, uh, we have to see what happened in some weeks, 15, 16 of June, will be more, four new judges and four new commissioners. That is very important and uh, only one, four gentlemen and one lady candidates. And we're seven judges, seven gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, we have to be uh, aware of that. No, but I can't tell anymore because um, we, I take note of that. <laughs> May I also uh, respond uh, uh, to your very interesting provocation? I like provocations. <laughs> and uh, I would like to uh, <coughs> rescue something which happened during my years, because I'm speaking only for my years, and uh, this was um, 
uh, at the time that we changed our regulations, and I proposed before, uh, first the com Commission on uh, Legal and Political Affairs of the OAS, then at the Permanent Council, and then in the General Assembly of the OAS, three times I proposed. What? The supervision of execution of judgments of the court on a permanent basis, I proposed. And then, with the support of all my colleagues, I presented a draft additional protocol to the American Convention. And every year I listen the same response from the delegations. We are studying it, we are studying it, we are studying it. Uh, they studied it openly until 2008, though they probably put it on the shelf and that was it. Now, what was the proposal? That since the general assemblies were no longer one week long, but they were spasmodic just one day, it would not be, be possible to examine the compliance with the judgments of the courts in one day. It's impossible. So I proposed. Do you know what happened? Uh, they said the proposal was extremely interesting and they would, would go and study it. They are studying it until today, you said, that it, it's been shelved. <laughs> and uh, what it has to do without this proposal that you mentioned? Uh, well, although I, I'm, far, I'm far from Latin America nowadays, no, and uh, I'm not so familiar with what's happening here, but I can tell you, uh, when I proposed the permanent commission of the permanent council to help the inter-American court with the compliance with the judgments of the court, I had in mind those, those which were parties to the convention had accepted the court's jurisdiction. Then the reaction was, no, open-ended group. I said, that will not work because it's not fair if st states which not parties to the convention have not accepted the court's jurisdiction would be complying, uh, studying compliance with judgments of the court, uh, non-compliance. But I never said exclude the others. I said a, a general study, permanent study made by not an open-ended, but a, a, a subcommittee of the permanent council of the OAS to study that. Until now, nothing at all has been done. Nothing. This was in 2000, 2001. So inertia has prevailed. Now, the other point I made was that individuals should appear directly before the court, but I never proposed the extinction of the commission. Why? Because the commission exercises the functions as an organ, not only of the convention, but also of the OAS, vis-a-vis States which are not parties to the convention have not accepted the court's jurisdiction. So the, the commission is important for these other states. And also it applies the American Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Men. So I never excluded anyone because it's not good to exclude the states because then those who are under the jurisdiction of the state, uh, of the state will live without protection, will be left without protection, you see? So, but now I'm far away. I'm far away. I'm not familiar with what's going on here. Uh, but I, I, uh, all the proposals are advanced. Direct access of individuals to the court without extinguishing the commission, without excluding anyone. And also supervision on a permanent basis of compliance with judgments of the court, but to be exercised only by those without excluding anyone. We have to add, not to diminish. You know? Otherwise, uh, it will uh, dilute, it will weaken even more uh, the process. You know? And uh, what we are seeking nowadays is, in my view, a crisis of values. A crisis of values. We don't know what the consequences will be. But I, I feel very much worried about this. I think that one step forward, which was adopted by the court of the days of Eduardo Ferrer, my friend, uh, an important point has been the court has taken upon itself the burden of supervision of execution of its own decisions. That's too much for the court, but it has done so. It did, as from a judgment in my, in my years, uh, in 2003, at the end of 2003, uh, by Ana Ricardo and others. By Ana Ricardo and others, we took the courageous step of holding public hearings 
for supervision by the court itself of its own decisions. That was extremely daring. I felt so sorry for the court to take up this responsibility because it does not have the benefit of another organ to help it in the compliance of the judgments, like the Committee of Ministers of the European Court. The European Court is helped by the Committee of Ministers. We, in the Inter-American Court, which is very close to my heart, the Inter-American Court, does not help anyone to help her. So, the states are not interested in a strong court. That's the problem. And that's what we see nowadays. We only have five more minutes. So, I take two more questions, Christina, and, and your question, and I think we close after that. Thank you. My name is Christina Serna. I don't have any provocative questions, uh, but I have two little questions. One is, especially for Antonio, looking at the history of the European court and the fact that the right to appeal is a basic human right, um, do you think in the future there will be some kind of appeal process within the inter-American court? Um, and the second question is, uh, with regard to the control of conventionality doctrine, um, I was very pleased to hear your presentation because I had a misunderstanding of the doctrine. I thought that even for states that were not parties to the case, that they were today obliged to uh, do a control of conventionality with the court's judgments. So to hear you say that it's only for the parties to the case that are compelled to do the control of conventionality uh, with respect to a judgment, but those that are not parties should comply, but that they're not legally obliged to comply. But I think from reading court judgments, you're moving in the direction that all states will eventually be seen to be compelled to comply with all of the judgment, creating a kind of stare decisis in the inter-American system. And I'm wondering if you see that as a gateway to avoid this incredible duplication uh, that you see. I mean, how many amnesty law cases do we have, from Barrios Altos to, uh, as you mentioned, Almonacid, uh, Araguaya, et cetera, et cetera. In the future, do you think if states uh, do a control of conventionality that that will somehow reduce the duplication of the kinds of judgments we see? Who starts? It's for you too. So one person has to start. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I would like to, uh, very briefly to thank very much Professor Cristina Serna. Cristina has been a colleague, for, a friend for so many years, and we have shared many reflections together. You know, I am very worried about the European system as well. I, I had the honor to, to, to do the opening of the Judicial Leader of last year. They asked me to speak on, on, on the question of the present procedures, what I think as a judge of another court, and I am very much worried about uh, their, their uh, recent uh, changes in their rules. No, they, do you know that they have a, a permanent committee on reforms of the, of the convention, of the uh, procedures? It's a permanent committee. They're permanently discussing reform because of the overload of cases which they have. Now, how can they have, without appeal, decisions on admissibility by one judge? That goes against the notion of collegiality of international tribunals. So sometimes a decision is, it's very easy to make a mistake if you're just one. If you're three, it's a better chance to, a better chance to do well. If you're five, uh, even better chance. But if just one to decide the question of admissibility. So they themselves, they say, well, the best way is to have our uh, les happy law, the pilot judgments. And, uh, like uh, jurisprudencia vinculata in America Latina. Mm -hmm. Jurisprudencia vinculata. Jurisprudencia vinculata. So, they are using pilot judgments to avoid you know, appeals and uh, this kind of thing. Now, I know that the president of the European Court, a, a personal friend of mine, he spends 95% of his time meeting 
uh, the Supreme Courts of the different countries in, in the 47 states of the European Convention. Now, uh, coming now to the last part of your question, Cristina, what about the, the Inter-American Court? I think the ideal number, for instance, for, uh, for the court to have uh, judges would be 11, but uh, this has never been changed, it's seven judges, so to have a two-chamber system for appeals, but there is always the possibility of, for example, uh, requests for interpretation and for revision. That is possible, uh, and that is feasible. But uh, this is already a possibility. So uh, there is a possibility to, to fix uh, elements uh, of the judgment which are not clearly uh, conceptualized if they are related to the original claim, to the original complaint, you know, the, uh, pre the petition. But uh, apart from that, if it, if it requires changes in the composition of the court, it's very unlikely that it will happen. But I think the position of the Inter-American Court is better than the European Court in, in relation to admissibility matters. But we will continue talking about this. <laughs> Thank you very much for your question. Well, it's a very important question. Um, no. In the origin of the doctrine, in Almonacid uh, Arellano. Arellano, it says you know, to follow not only the American Convention, but also the jurisprudence of the court. So, implicitamente, uh, implicitly, it was there that the effect of the judgment has to be ergaudness. But the first time that the court said it, it was in the resolution of compliance with the case of Hellman case in 2013. And with all the words, with all the words says uh, that uh, their resolution has to have a, an, uh, an erga omnes effect. So I believe in that. I wrote a concurrent vote in that, uh, a strong concurrent vote, because I think this is a practical reason behind the, the binding nature of the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court. The fact that individuals have limited access to the court. Only 178 cases in 35 years. 187 cases in 35 years. So I'm not worried about the number of cases. I hope it can be more cases and different cases, no? If we see, I was just looking yesterday, all the jurisprudence of the court, all the type of cases that um, in these 36 years uh, have been resolved, and 100, almost 150 cases of these 187 cases are grave violations of human rights. 90 cases about torture and other cruel, inhuman, and degradant punishment. 45 cases, 30% of all the jurisprudence about extrajudicial execution, individual massacres. A 42 cases, 28% of all the jurisprudence about forced disappearance of persons. The first case, Velázquez Rodríguez, and one of the last cases, uh, Palacio de Justicia versus Colombia. 42 cases about this. Military jurisdiction, 30 cases, 20%. Amnesty laws, uh, 14 cases. No, that's 9% uh, of the court. I hope in the future we can have more cases and different cases, different cases, so uh, we can't uh, uh, interpret more the American Convention. I'm not worried about the number of cases. I hope in the future we can have more. Uh, yeah, and, I know. And, 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 and I just want to uh, say that for the access to, no, we need to increase the budget no? <laughs> <laughs> of yeah. the system. 52% 50, uh, of the, yes. uh, uh, it's not uh, financial by the states. Mm -hmm. It's financial by other states, European states. So this is the reality of the inter-American system. I had promised that gentleman that he would be <laughs> in a position to put a, a question. Yeah. No. no. Okay. So I want to uh, join and uh, to ask you to join me to thank you very much to Antonio and uh, Cansado Trindadi and uh, Eduardo Ferrer Magregor. Uh, we uh, thank you very much for your positions about this inter-American system. All the people in the room uh, think that the inter-American system is too important. Uh, and that's why we are here. And we can go on with the provocative question about these new features.
that uh, uh, politicians in the world and the inter-American system want to, this system to become. In any case, according to me, they are speaking of something completely different from a human rights system. But in any case, those creations may take place in the near future. Uh -huh. I'm pretty sure of that. Thank you very much. Thank you.